All right, we're in 1 John chapter 1. Uh, 1 John, excuse me, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. And uh, we have been in 1 John. This is the eighth message that we preached in 1 John. And uh, we'll refer back to a few of the things here in just a moment by way of review. But uh, the Bible tells us uh, in verse number 1, and I'll tell you what, let me, I'm going to back up two verses and read verse 28 and 29 of chapter 2. And it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Uh, verse 29, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now, chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, uh, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now in chapter 1 and 2, God, or the, the Bible here, and, and John speaks of the fact that God is light, and that we're to walk in the light as he is in the light. Light speaks of holiness. But here in the, the, the second latter part of the second and the third chapter, he deals with the love of God. God is also not only holy, but God is love. He has illustrated that love in the fact that he sent Jesus Christ to down the cross. He shed his blood that we may be saved, forgiven, and that we might be brought into this fellowship with God. And so though God is holy, he is also love. And he has made a way now that we are not now. In 1 John, he's talking about uh, we'll get into the fellowship. But now we are more than getting into the fellowship. We get into sonship. We are not just uh, friends. We are children of God and the sons of God. So that I'm more than a friend who is in fellowship. I am a son of God, a child of God. Uh, the Bible talks about in John chapter 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now I'm just going to go through basically verses 1 and 2. And I want you to notice in verse 1 that first word, behold. Behold means um, uh, I'm about to make a very, very important announcement. It would be like uh, someone in Paul's day or other days who would go down to the marketplace and they would say, Behold, that means let me have your undivided attention because I'm about to say something very, very, very important. The word means to look, to perceive, to understand, to examine, to inspect, to discover, to discern, to experience. To take notice of something. It is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 12, uh, 5, verse 12, when he says this, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them. That word know there is the same word as the word behold. So Paul says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you and the Lord, and admonish you. So he's talking to the church about honoring the man of God, the pastor. And he said, I want you to know them. I want you to behold them. I want you to come to know them uh, and examine them and, and uh, be a, uh, a help to them and be a support to them. Uh, I'll give you about three different ways it was used. It was used when the wise men saw the star. Uh, and they said, Behold. It was used when Herod saw that he was mocked of them. And they said, Behold. When the wise men saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they said, Behold. And so it was very important announcements that were made. Behold. Look. Uh, pay attention. Let me have your undivided attention. Now notice he says what we're to behold. We're beholding, number two, 
What manner of love? What manner of love? That word manner means, uh, has the background, the idea of something that is strange, something that is foreign, uh, something that is not familiar, something that is not normal. It was used uh, uh, concerning people from another tribe or country. Uh, or we would ask the question, what foreign nation are they from? It's like uh, uh, you go to different places and you see people, even right here, you see people dressed differently. Uh, they're probably Muslims and we see them dressed differently. They speak differently. Uh, you immediately know they're from a different country, different culture, uh, different nationality, different religion, different environment. And that's what this word, the uh, manner, means. It means, behold, what strange thing. This is strange to mankind because the love of God transcends. It is far above the love of men. It is the love of God. He said, what manner of love. That word love found 263 times in the New Testament. And it is a selfless love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sacrificed his son because he loved us. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, For Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So it is a selfless love, this love of God. It is a sacrificial love. He gave his only begotten son. He didn't give one of many children. He only had one son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was his son. He loved them. The Bible talks about the sacrificial love. Let me give you another verse, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Listen. He says, we are to love, walk in love as Christ loved us with that selfless, sacrificial love and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You know, in the Old Testament, they offered the sacrifices and they would say uh, that the smoke off of the altar was a sweet-smelling savor uh, in the nostrils of God. He was, he was pleased. He realized a sacrifice had been made. A man had gone and had um, uh, taken the very best lamb that he had and sacrificed it uh, for his relationship with God. Jeremiah talks about the fact that we have a, subje a, a, a substantial love. That means a whole lot of love. We say to him about a man, he has a substantial sum of money. That means he has a lot of money. And this is the love of God, a substantial love. The Bible says he loved them unto the end. In John 13, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, said he loved the disciples and he loved them unto the end. All the way back in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31 and verse 3, he said, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And so here's Jeremiah in the midst of apostasy and idolatry. They took Jeremiah. They hated his preaching. They put him down in a pit. And uh, Jeremiah just about gave up. He said, I'm not preaching anymore. But he said, but the Lord put that word in my heart. And he said, thy word was like a fire in my bones. And I could not forbear. I couldn't hold back preaching the word of God. The very first mention of love is in Genesis 22. You would think it would talk about a mother's love. But it talks about a father's love. So when Abraham took Isaac upon the mountain to sacrifice him. And God said to Abraham, He said, I want you to take thy son, thy son whom thou lovest. And the first mention of it in the New Testament is when it says this in Matthew 3, 17, And the voice from heaven came saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John 13, 1, Now therefore before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world uh, unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. 
In 1 John 4, 10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the powers of the air uh, or the prince of the kings of the earth and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so we find here that there is this sacrificial love, this selfless love, this substantial love. It's an everlasting love, a love that has no end. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Let me tell you something tonight. This good news that God does love you. We, we associate the love of God with things. You know, if things go well this week, we say, well, you know, God loves me. Next week, everything falls apart, and we wonder, oh, does God really love me? Let this happen. It doesn't matter what happens. We live right here on the earth. It's a sin-cursed world. Our bodies fail. Our friends will fail us. The church will fail us. Your pastor will fail you. But that doesn't change the love of God. He has an everlasting love. It didn't change his love toward Israel, even when they were in adultery and idolatry and, and idol worship. He still loved them. When the disciples uh, had the faith, he'd say to them, Oh, you have little faith. He still loved them. So no matter what you go through, no matter what condition you're in, you can always know this, that God loves his people and God loves you. It says the next phrase, the Father hath bestowed uh, on us, bestowed upon us. Bestowed means to give, to grant something, to put, to show, to deliver something to someone, to violent voluntarily give something to someone to their advantage. Sometimes we give things to our advantage. We give things to others knowing they'll probably give something back to us. But this love of God is voluntarily giving something to someone just for their advantage and their blessing. It means to bestow a gift. It means to give to someone who has asked you for something. It means to supply or furnish what is necessary. It means to give over, to deliver, to reach out, to extend or present. It speaks strongly of the grace of God and of unmerited favor. A love beyond our desire. And listen, before I got saved, I didn't desire the love of God. I didn't even know what it was. I just wanted to be saved. I, wanted, I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to be forgiven. I wanted to have some peace, but I sure didn't desire it in that sense. I, I desired to be saved, but the love of God, I, I didn't know all the verses about the love of God. I knew John 3, 16, but that was not on my mind when I got saved. When I got saved was if I don't get saved, I don't give my life to Christ, I'm going to die and go to hell. It's beyond our deserving. We don't deserve it. I never thought I deserved it. I didn't get saved so I could get into the love of God. That was just icing on the cake. That's just a second blessing. And then it's beyond our doubting. When you start doubting the love of God, it doesn't matter. God still loves you. We all have times of doubt. We all go through, we talked about this morning, times of testings and trials and trouble and heartache and sorrow and setbacks and disappointments and, and family problems and others, and we begin to doubt, Lord, do you really love me? But he does. It's not related to things that happen around us. It's not related to your emotions or how you feel. It is just a scriptural fact that God is love. The Bible doesn't say just that God loves us. God is love. He is the very substance and the very essence of love. If there was no God, there would be no love in this world, none at all, because he is the source of all love. The Bible talks about being the sons of God. Now, there's two results of the, of the love of God. Notice number one, that we should be called the sons of God. We're called the sons of God. We are now have a new name, the sons of God. Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature 
waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, that you may be blameless and, har and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. God says you're in a crooked and perverse nation. He said that about the Roman Empire, but I'll tell you what, it's even, I think, has to be worse today. And all this transgender stuff and all they're trying to what to teach our kids and kindergarten kids to learn them by the fact that they can change their gender and all this kind of stuff. It is wicked. We live in a wicked world. But I'm thankful that we still have the love of God. He said in Galatians 4, 5, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. We've not only been birthed into the family, we've been adopted into the family. That's a privilege that is not granted to the angels, uh, the principalities or powers. It is given only to repentant, redeemed sinners. What a wonderful place that is and what a wonderful position that we hold. What a privilege it is to be called the sons of God. Not just the children of God. It was the sons in a Roman family who received the inheritance. Remember the two, the two sons, the prodigal and his older brother. And we find that they, they wanted their inheritance. The younger brother wanted it right now. The older son waited till later. And so usually it was not given until the father died or until he got beyond years and could take care of the property and, and maybe have the mind to sign paperwork and all that kind of stuff we go through. But a woman didn't receive inheritance. She married someone who received the inheritance. Her husband would have received an inheritance from his father, but she did not get one. But I'm glad that, ladies, you all are also included in the sons of God. You are a child of God. You are a son of God. And you have the privilege of being adopted into the family. And you know, it is law that you cannot leave an adopted child out of the, fam out of the, out of the will, out of the inheritance. If they're adopted, they have to have some kind of part of that inheritance. You cannot mistreat them. You cannot leave them out because they were adopted. And so the Bible talks about the fact that we have an inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even as we were once sinners, but we have been taken into the family, birthed into the family, adopted into the family, and now we are the sons of God. Next phrase says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world really only knows the wrath of God. There's the conviction of the Holy Ghost, which convicts them of sin, of righteousness and judgment. As I said, before I was saved, I did not think about the love of God. I have one preacher friend who said, I got saved when I realized how much God loved me, that he would give his son for me. But that's not usually the case. The world only knows the wrath of God, the condemnation of God. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the Son of God. Uh, it does not understand us, anyone who really believes and revels and enjoys the love of God. One sign of sure salvation is that the world does not understand us. It does not perceive us. It does not, it can't get a, its mind wrapped around people who are saved, truly saved, and rejoicing and praising God for His love, His mercy, His grace, His salvation. It's a, it's a family, you know, our family, our own family sometimes does not understand our relationship to God. I have family, I have brothers who don't understand my relationship to God. And uh, I, I've tried to talk to them about it, but they really, two of them don't want to hear it. The other one professes to be saved. I don't know if he is or not, uh, but there has not been a lot of fruit over the years. Does not understand how we can say we are saved and know it. But right here in 1 John is that wonderful assurance verse that says, that These things I have written unto you that believe on the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. I'm glad I know that I'm a child of God. I know I'm a son of God. I know I have eternal life. Not because I'm something special or did something special. 
It's just that I trusted Christ and the peace of God came in and his voice spoke to me and said, you are now my child. There's a song in our hymnal, a child of the king, a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of God, son of God. Look at verse 2. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now I want you to notice, first of all, that word now. That's a present assurance. He says, now are we the sons of God. There's some people saying, well, I guess I'll have to wait till I die to find out if I'm saved or not. No, it would be too late then. You, know, you can know you're saved now. Now are we the sons of God. Now have our sins be forgiven. Now is when we need that assurance. Now is when we know that we have eternal life. So it is a present assurance. Now are we the sons of God. Not only, but notice this, it's a puzzling appearance. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. You say, preacher, what are we, what, what are we going to be like when we're in heaven? I don't know for sure. I don't know. I know we'll have a perfect body. Jesus died when he was 33. Maybe we'll have our 33-year-old our body. But I know what? It'll be a perfect body. There'll be no aches, no pains. Uh, I won't weigh what I weigh. I'll weigh about 180 pounds. <laughs> and I'll have all a full head of hair. <laughs> Hallelujah, Brother Barry. Amen. And uh, we'll just, I mean, it'll be a perfect body. It does not yet appear what we shall be. We don't know for sure all the details. People say, do you know, will we know each other in heaven? I think we will. The Bible says that Abraham, uh, uh, Abraham uh, and his sons, Isaac and Jacob, sat down in the kingdom. They sat down by families. And so don't yet appear what we shall be. I don't know, but I know it's going to be good. In ver and then it says, and when he shall appear, there is a positive, prospective appearance, when he shall appear. John doesn't say if he shall appear, he says when he shall appear. But I'm telling you what, it is a joy to know that I can get up tomorrow morning and maybe Jesus will come. He may come before the service is over. He may come before the morning. He may rapture us out in the middle of the night. He may take us to heaven and on the way up, we'll get that perfect body. And we'll stand before him, perfect in a perfect body, and go to the judgment seat of Christ where our sins which have been forgiven will not be brought up, but our works, how we served him, shall be rewarded. Then notice, we shall be like him. Man, I like that. Promised likeness. A promised likeness. We shall be like him, not only in body, but we'll be like him in our spirit, in our soul, in our emotions, in our in our everything spiritual, we shall be like him. His grace, his compassion, his mercy, his friendliness. He was a friend of sinners, the Bible says. And so we shall be like him. Then there is perception realized. We shall see him as he is. The same Jesus that went into the tomb came up out of the tomb. The same Jesus wasn't a spirit. It wasn't a different body. Matter of fact, he told Thomas and others, he said, look at the prints of my hands and the scars in my feet, and you'll see that I am the same Jesus that was crucified. And so he retains those scars, those prints from his crucifixion, and we shall see him as he is. The exact image of Christ that he had on earth, he'll have in heaven, and we shall see him. And then the last thing he says is in chapter 3, verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. You know, when you were a kid and you had uh, maybe, um, you were the oldest kid and you sort of put in charge of the younger kids and mom and dad went away for the evening to go visit family or friends or go out to dinner or something like that, I don't know. And uh, they said, we'll be home at 10 o'clock sharp. We'll be home at 10 o'clock. So about 9.30, 9.40, the older son, oh, so, oh, oh we got to get the house cleaned up. 
because mom and dad are coming back in just a few minutes. We've got to get the house cleaned up. Well, that's what he's saying here. If we really believe Jesus is coming, we'd keep the house clean. We'd keep our hearts right. We'd keep our lives right. We'd try to walk holy. He said, every man that hath this hope in him, what's the hope? That we shall see him. We shall be like him. And we shall see him as he is when he shall appear. We don't know what time he's coming. That's why we need to be ready all the time. He said, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he, Christ, is pure. If I, really, if I really went to bed tonight and said, Lord, you could come tonight, you know what I'd do tomorrow? I'd keep myself pure. I wouldn't want to be caught out of place doing something wrong, saying something wrong, being in a, in a, in a wrong attitude, being in a wrong place. I, I wouldn't want that. I would hope he would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so he says, if you really believe, do you believe Jesus is coming? He said, if you do really believe he's coming, at any moment, any time he could come, then you would purify yourself. You'd keep yourself pure, even as he is pure. You know, we have in here the righteousness of God. That's justification that he took my sins and gave me his righteousness. I stand justified before God. He has declared me righteous in his sight. And when I stand before God, I'll stand before him perfectly righteous. But what will I be until that day comes? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Let's bow for prayer, please.